very, very warm welcome um, to many old friends uh, and, and new colleagues. We only have 45 minutes, so I want to keep my introductory comments short and the introductions to my colleagues very short. I'm sure they don't need an introduction. Peter Peart, uh, director of the London School, ex-head of UNAIDS, uh, one of the original discoverers of Ebola. Jeremy Farrow, director of the Wellcome Trust, global charity with uh, about $30 billion, uh, a billion to give away a year, and a background in emerging infections last 18 years in Vietnam. Tom Frieden, director of probably the, arguably, in my view, the most respected public health agency in the world, director of the CDC. Uh, infectious disease epidemiologist with a long background in tuberculosis and many others. So we are the panel. Um, I want to try and frame the discussion to begin with, which we will have between the three of us, and then I want to spend as much time as we can opening it up for discussion, both to you and the audience here and worldwide to the uh, social media audience who will be sending in questions. And to frame those questions, what we've been asked to address is what are the most important changes, and that's the very important word, changes needed to improve global health security. Uh, there will be many discussions around Ebola, of course, in this uh, World Economic Forum, and I don't want to focus solely on Ebola, but we cannot talk about this without putting it into some context of Ebola. Um, but I think we have to look at it in the context of the last decade, which has been a decade in part uh, defined by emerging infections. I was very involved, too closely involved. Carlo Urbani was a very good friend of mine who died of SARS almost just over a decade ago uh, now. Uh, but it's come through a series of many, many epidemics in that time. These are not rare events. And whenever they happen, regionally or globally, they not only cause the devastation of the epidemic that themselves, but they have a, long, uh, a longer effect on the social structures and health beyond the individual disease we're talking about. So the first is the epidemics in the context of other emerging, of emerging infections and non-endemic -en infections, and also with the rise of the non-communicable diseases. And how do we balance those? How do we better prepare and how do we better respond? And those two things cannot be divorced. We cannot just prepare. We have to learn how to respond. And you cannot do any of that without some discussion and debate and challenge about global governance. And there's many involved in that in this room today and we'd like to hear from. And then finally, and we don't want this to be a bland session of discussion, how can we make the changes that could lead to a better global governance and a better ability to respond to the challenges we will inevitably face in the 21st century. I'd like to start off before handing over um, to, to Peter um, with a quote. The world was ill-prepared for this or any other global public health emergency. Review, a review was conducted and recommended sweeping reforms, strengthening health capacity globally, international reserve that could respond to epidemics, clear coordination amongst UN agencies and other partners, and a contingency fund to pay for it. That was written a decade ago around SARS. Ask yourself if we've done any of that in the intervening 10 years, and let's make sure we do do those things in the next decade. So Peter, to pick up that challenge. Yeah, thanks uh, Jeremy. And uh, I could add on a, on a smaller scale, after the first Ebola epidemic in 76, um, I attended my first ever WHO meeting. It was in London, also the first time I went to the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. And there was also a whole plan was designed for epidemic preparedness. This was in January 1977, so last century, and um, you, we all know what happened. Um, first, maybe a, a few words about uh, Ebola itself. Um, together with the uh, Swiss franc, this was probably the, the black swan event of the last 12 months. Um, you know, that was totally unanticipated, and uh, um, we could not have predicted um, in, uh, on the basis of what happened uh, the uh, 37 previous years. Um, and just two other points. One is that um, what we read in the newspapers today is that it's, it's over, that there are more hospital beds than patients, and so on and so on. Don't be fooled by that. It's not over yet, and it's going to, uh, going to be probably a long tail and a bumpy road before it's really finally over. In other words, when the last person with Ebola infection has either died or has recovered without having infected anybody else because that's what it will require. And, um, and that means that we need to uh, rethink at this stage, go to the, to the, to the next phase. Now, what is new? And, and w Ebola for me is an, an opportunity, um, as with every crisis. And um, we, we have to make sure that um, 10 years from now, we won't be able to sit here as even older men. I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm the eldest, and no, you're, yeah. the young, you're young, you're um, young. 
that we, um, you know, that we will have learned from it and that we are better prepared. And I think the global health context has changed in several ways. Um, one, the what? I mean, there are not only epidemics and there will be new infectious diseases, emerging diseases and new Ebola and other epidemics will continue to appear even if the, um, you know, non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases uh, are the main causes of death and morbidity in the world. So we need to, uh, you know, to make sure that we are far better prepared. Secondly, we need a new paradigm. Um, it's actually uh, mind-blowing that today with Ebola we still have the same kind of medieval approaches as we had in 76. Isolation, quarantine, safe burials. And they work to a certain extent. But one of the things I've learned from dealing with HIV is that you need a very comprehensive approach. You need, of course, prevention, you need cultural approaches, but you also should not neglect what uh, modern technology uh, offers us, uh, both in terms of vac vaccines and treatments. Um, and I wish we had been better prepared so that we could have tested them earlier, um, but also in terms of, uh, let's say, sequencing and so on to, to follow what is going on. And thirdly, um, we, need a, uh, we need better instruments. Um, and, and we'll come back to that. Tom, I'm going to turn to you. And I, I should have told you about this before, but I forgot to do it. But anyway, March 2013, you said, without doubt, we're better prepared today than we've ever been thanks to better coordination and innovations. We need to detect in real time lives because lives and economies will depend on how quickly we can detect threats. Do you still think that is the problem? Or do you think it's our inability to act having detected something? Where do we get this balance right? Fundamentally, there are three things we have to do. We have to find things quickly, respond effectively, and prevent them wherever possible. Uh, every, any way you break it down, it comes back to those three things. And for each of those things, there's a lot more that's needed at the national level, where we need networks to monitor, at the global level, where we need uh, a much more robust ability to assist when something exceeds national capacity, and also at the coordination level between not just uh, public institutions, but also the private sector and others. So if you just go back to that triumvirate of find, stop, prevent, for each of those things, there's so much progress that we need to make and can make. It's within reach, but it's hard work. Some of it will require or be benefited by new tools. I think we'll have new diagnostics for Ebola within the next few months. Uh, they won't be perfect, but they'll be better, more usable in the field than what we have now, uh, if things go as we anticipate they will. Uh, but still, you need uh, a system to track. You need health care providers who are reporting to public health. You need a reporting system. You need a laboratory network to get specimens in. A few years ago, as a proof of principle of global health security in Uganda, we worked with the national government. We used some of the, the backbone that was established through the PEPFAR program. And we established a countrywide national network so that if an undiagnosed condition occurred anywhere, a motorcycle courier would carry the specimen to a hub. It would be transported overnight to the central laboratory. The central laboratory would be safely, accurately tested, and then the result would be sent by essentially a GSM printer and print at the local clinic and also print at an emergency operations center. Uh, this was not particularly difficult to put into place, but it required roads overnight couriers, laboratory systems, trained staff. This is all hard work that can be done. It's within reach. Uh, in the Ebola funding authorization, which Congress just approved in the US, we now have hundreds of millions of dollars to begin to do things like this in more places. But there's much more needed from well, countries how, around the world we, and the private sure sector. That, that those monies, and the US government should be credited because they have played a leading role in this, how do we ensure that that money which becomes available in the context of a crisis is, is continued when you stop the crisis? Because if I go back to SARS, and if I go back to bird flu, and if I go back to EV71, and if I go back, and I could go on and on, we've been good at doing that. What we haven't been good at is we've cut your budget, we've cut the WHO's. How do we ensure that politicians understand that it's, we, you have to be in this for the long term? Well, it's obviously impossible to ensure, but there are a couple of things we can do to increase the likelihood. One is success. Success breeds success. So when you have 
examples of programs that are working, they tend to recruit more support for themselves. And the second is accountability. We don't currently have something like the Transparency International Index for global health security, but we need it. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, Peter, but I'll push you on that one again, Tom. Um, success, you never get credit for things you prevent because they weren't going to happen anyway. In fact, many of us were very heavily criticised uh, for the pandemic because we overreacted, apparently. How do, we, how do you get credit when you stop something which somebody will say, well, it wasn't going to happen? You know, there is a, a theme in public health where people say, oh, it's hopeless because when we succeed, nothing happens, nobody sees it. I don't think that's right. I think we need to be more creative, more effective at communicating what happens. I'll tell you a story. Uh, three years ago, an 11-year-old girl tragically died of Ebola in Uganda. That's the end of the story. There was no outbreak because we and the Ugandans and WHO and others had trained the hospital how to do infection control, had trained the laboratory how to test for Ebola, had uh, motivated people so that they would rapidly isolate someone who had fever and cough and assess them. And so it's the only example I know of in nature of a solitary case of Ebola. So there was no outbreak, but that story can be told. Uh, similarly, in Uganda also, we have a rapid dipstick to test for plague. 20-minute test, determined plague, worked with local healers, referred to health centers. Uh, last year, a year before, a uh, young man, a farmer with a family, came in with a cough and fever, referred by a traditional healer, diagnosed with Ebola, put on a clinical trial, because we're not sure, uh, sorry, diagnosed with uh, plague, plague. Uh, pneumonic plague, put on a clinical trial because we're not certain the optimal treatment, three days later is back at work in the fields. So I think telling those I'd stories I'd be interested how many in the audience would have heard of that. Probably nobody. Or the Ebola case in Uganda, I guess. And that is a problem with communication. Peter, do you think we've still got a problem also with the way we construct the education of young people such that we call somebody an epidemiologist and that's a very traditional, dare I say, 19th century because we haven't done very many different things to what Jon Snow would have done uh, in the 19th century, in fact, and that we've separated from that the more uh, genetics, the clinical, the social sciences, the anthropology, and that we don't see all of those together in being the modern epidemiologists. Yeah, I should disclose I have a zero dip diploma in epidemiology or public health, and um, I'm an infectious disease person and a, a microbiologist. Is no, I think that we need to rethink also uh, how we approach public health. Um, and. Um, it, is, it was really good for the times that um, in um, high-income countries, um, infectious diseases, malnutrition and so were really uh, the predominant causes of uh, death and, and, and disease. Today that's completely different. Um, we, we have uh, chronic diseases that are really dominant also outside sub-Saharan Africa in the rest of the world. So for me that should be part also of global health security, but it requires very different types of approaches. On the one hand, very strong uh, policies. I mean, tobacco is still the biggest killer. And like in Africa, there is a huge opportunity to keep Africa uh, at a very low, low level of uh, use of tobacco. That's going to prevent millions of deaths, but maybe nobody will say thank you. But then but secondly, we have to integrate far more what science has to offer today. And I think that, uh, you know, if you're just coming back to the current Ebola epidemic, but also the same story with SARS, with the, you know, pandemic flu, and uh, um, yeah, the, um, if we would have been ready with um, protocols for testing out new experimental drugs, new vaccines, uh, when uh, the epidemic started, we could have had a bigger impact, I think, by combining the classic public health measures and um, you know what modern science and technology is offering. So we need to rethink that uh, that paradigm. Yes. Jeremy, Jeremy, I just want Tom. to stand up for a minute for yeah, yeah. for epidemiology, because one of the single most important things I think that CDC has done around the world is to train thousands of epidemiologists in field epidemiology. How do you establish and evaluate a surveillance system? How do you find and stop an outbreak? I traveled last month with a field epidemiologist from Uganda sent by the African Union to work in rural Liberia, helping to stop the outbreaks there. He had worked on Ebola outbreaks. He knew surveillance. He knew infection control. And we need many, many more trained epidemiologists. We also need to incorporate new tools, analytics, presentation, uh, data transfer, uh, looking at big data, looking at other data sources. But the bottom line of training someone 
rigorously how to think about data and how to use it to protect health. That's a skill that we need to get many more people uh, trained. I stand up for myself here because, because we've been looking at your program. In fact, we've both been looking yeah. at your program over the last few weeks to see how we could, A, replicate it, and B, dare I say it, improve it. Yeah, yeah. Because and we I, see it as the model uh, globally, actually, that's right. for the training but of young epidemiologists of the future. So we're absolutely on side, and we'll be coming to see you anywhere about it. But that's another right, story. Right, because our school also, I mean, we've been producing thousands of epidemiologists, but I think it's necessary, but not enough. And it's, it's necessary for the field work. And for example, what we need now in, uh, you know, to deal with the, the, the fine, the last mile of Ebola uh, will require very haute couture, I call it uh, epidemiology, really, really uh, detective work in the field. Um, but when you think of the big global health threats, we need more than that. And we need to bring it all together. And that schism between uh, you know, public health, the world of prevention, and clinical medicine and science, I think that is one of the big, uh, you know, obstacles that we have to overcome. Yeah, it's something I've certainly talked on regularly with a, with a title of public health, clinical medicine and the rest of health being divorced for too long. Yeah. Uh, and I think it, it has been. But, Tom, fear not, it is the model that we hope to follow and emulate. Peter, everybody likes to kick Geneva and WHO um, and I think it's been unhelpful in many times. But nevertheless, they are the leading authority for global public health. Where is their future, do you think? Well, the world needs WHO. Let's just start with that. And I think the last thing we need would be which to invent and, and set up uh, yet another organization just to deal at the global level with um, emergencies. But we need a much better WHO, that's for sure also. Um, one that um, can... Uh, that has the capacity and the courage to intervene um, where epidemics arise, because that's a global public good. Um, and, you know, where we have a strong central uh, body, uh, entity, whatever you call it, within WHO that is protected and that can be deployed together with others, with CDC and with whoever, uh, and in, of course the countries and can be deployed immediately. And I'd rather be accused of overreacting than of underreacting. And but these sound good, but the truth is it'll be protected for a while until the, the, the Ebola becomes a distant memory, uh, particularly to those in Geneva, well, Washington, London, Paris, yeah. etc. And then it will be reduced. So that, that has been the, the track record um, over the last 20 years. Yeah, and actually um, I think that many countries don't want a strong WHO. They don't want strong a multinational, uh, in, multilateral uh, uh, institutions. But I think that um, with growing awareness, I think of the danger and the risk of epidemics, uh, I think that the understanding for the time being, until as long as Ebola is in the news and then the next epidemic, there should be a, a, a protected uh, budget in WHO associated with a, you know, a strong um, reform movement. And one of the problems is the WHO offices in countries who are weak and uh, some of the regional offices. The regional office in Africa should be the strongest of all because that's where the biggest health uh, challenges are. It is the weakest. And so we need to find a way of strengthening that, but also uh, be you know, no compromise on quality and, on, uh, you know, and, and where the um, health of the people should come first. But the, Tom. The, the, uh, I was seconded to WHO for five years, so I've worked with them, and I, I don't think you should uh, just whole cloth say it's a problem. There are also terrific people within WHO yeah. who work very effectively, who are very knowledgeable. Uh, the challenge is, uh, as with people, as with organizations, your greatest strength is often your greatest weakness. With WHO, the fact that they do have the political buy-in of countries is also their greatest weakness. So how do you insulate yeah. from political yeah. influence the core technical issues that need to happen, including selection of regional directors, selection of country directors, staff decisions, uh, and speaking truth to power and telling you, it like it is. Would when, you keep the regional offices? Uh, I think they've either got to be greatly improved or their authorities have to be greatly reduced. Yeah, and yeah. This, was, this was a summary previously, either completely decentralized to very strong regional and national offices, or centralised. But the current hybrid doesn't quite get there either. Just to put on the record, I am a very, very strong believer in global bodies and an absolute believer in WHO uh, being strengthened so that it can serve its purpose. Uh, because I think otherwise a fragmented healthcare system globally is, 
is would be far far worse uh, yeah but i think that in case of uh, epidemics you need a global approach and it can't be i mean of course the action is on the ground um, one country or multiple countries regional but it is a threat to the rest of the world and again coming back to the notion of a global public good that's why you need a central type of body that can intervene and that can do the analysis uh, etc um, and uh, not decentralized I, I believe that for health systems uh, you know strengthening and so on I think that should be decentralized and that's something that has to be built up country by country but epidemic preparedness is something else you know? I, I agree with something. that however I don't think we should expect WHO to be able to do it all yeah. no, no, right? no, no. It, it needs to have a coordination and an intelligence function greater yeah. capacity than it has now more ability to reach into regions and countries yeah. But we need to build on entities like the Global Outbreak and Response Network yeah. to, to bring in MSF, to bring in uh, London School, to bring in CDC, yeah. to bring in other partners. The African Union has been phenomenal yeah. in West Africa. They've got 700 people there now. Yeah. Uh, close to 100 of them have been trained to your epidemiology but program. I think I'm so right. they'll make a difference. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think I'm right in those so-called non-state actors, which is not a term I like, but don't have any voice, certainly not on the executive board of WHO. They have no voice within the governance structure, uh, currently. At least they should have a voice in how to get things implemented and done, and they should be determinative in making sure it happens right. Okay, I'm going to open it up now. Um, questions on any subject, um, slice, price of bread, epidemics, global governance. Yeah. If you could just introduce yourself quickly, and then to whom you want to... Uh, for uh, blood tests, uh, which uh, give laboratory quality. So we think that technologically we are there for the rural areas uh, of the emerging markets. The technology is there. We don't need, uh, as Thomas said, uh, the couriers, the roads. So the cheap technology is there. We can do it very cheaply. Now, then the second problem we had is the distribution partner. Because in these places, it may not necessarily be the healthcare partner. It might be... Uh, you know, food distributor or even churches, you know, organizations like that. What we're struggling with uh, is that uh, how to educate the population that they actually need to do those regular checks, how to raise awareness among them because it's just something they have never done before. And that's something we cannot realize, actually. We cannot get it. I think this is a, a major problem because when the WHO, and I don't want to just talk about the WHO, it also applies to all of our organizations, was set up the night, the state itself was the deliverer <laughs> of all things in many, many countries. That's no longer true. How do we reach out, Peter, how do we reach out to the non-state actors, the churches, the community leaders, the, so the society, which is often actually delivering health care not, with nothing to do with governments? Well, in the case of, of AIDS, this has always been a given. Not always, in the, in the early days, but that was because the state didn't want to be involved with AIDS. So we went to the uh, non-governmental sector or whatever, civil society, uh, business, what have you. And um, it has not been um, without its problems. But there you've, you, you build local coalitions, and in some cases that's more like uh, church-affiliated uh, organizations that are providing health care. Uh, in others, it's uh, you know more for profit business. It can be in the case of epidemics, MSF, uh, just as uh, Tom says. But I think that that's something that has to be uh, uh, you know organized uh, within countries. And then I think at the at the global governance level, we have the example of the global fund, where um, you have representatives in this case of people living with HIV, NGOs, and so on, and business. I think it's not impossible and. It's one of the, I think, one of the issues that will be debated in WHO also, and I think that WHO should open up itself as well uh, for that, uh, so that you have a very pragmatic approach to, um, you know, to delivery, to setting policy. Although I know at the end of the day, it's the state that has the responsibility for policy, for, you know, uh, health security and so on. And but it cannot deliver everything. And Tom. also, the state has. A facilitative role for new technology. Yes, yes. Uh, it, we've seen all over the world totally inaccurate technologies marketed to the poor yeah. who pay top dollar for them uh, and are not benefited by yeah. them. 
So the combination of technologies that lead to real health improvements that people can recognize and a government infrastructure that without uh, impeding innovation uh, facilitates yeah. the delivery of reliable services in whether, whether it's public or private. Yeah. Point. Thank you. I'm Gary Cohen with BD. I'm also a member of the board of the CDC Foundation. Um, simple question. In, you mentioned Uganda and Kenya. Ebola outbreaks were quickly brought under control. Nigeria, during this recent outbreak, I think in large part because CDC already had emergency operation centers there, partially funded by Gates or largely funded for polio, quickly brought under control could have been a disaster. What needs to be done so Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia goes out of control? What are the fundamental things that need to be put in place? Who should fund it and who should implement it? Tom, do you want to start? I'll start. Uh, get to zero, stay at zero. Uh, get to zero by tracing every single chain of transmission. And that is the traditional epidemiology. It's a public health response. Uh, that means putting public health teams in all 62 of the subnational areas, breaking the urban areas into wards or units, and working really intensively so that every single case is tracked. In September, October, it was impossible. There were so many cases, it was mm -hmm. impossible. But now, with the waters receding, you can see the, the streams, and then you can stop the spread. But that also means going into every forest community of Guinea to identify whether there are cases. That's where it came from. That's where it's got to stop. And that's going to be very challenging, dealing with Resistance means, on the one hand, providing good, sensitive, timely, respectful services. On the other hand, dealing with community uh, perceptions or misperceptions of causes of illness. Having public health structures, having laboratory capacity, having treatment capacity, burial capacity were needed in every single place. Uh, we've seen tremendous progress in Liberia in the past couple of months. Uh, we are hopeful that we can see that kind of progress in Sierra Leone. But Guinea is a cautionary note because they've oscillated in cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You let up your guard and it comes roaring back. There's nothing there that I would a absolutely endorse all of that. The only thing I would add to that is your only opportunity to change this and future epidemics in a different way are to conduct research during this epidemic. You cannot work out how to treat an individual with Ebola unless you do that research within the context of an epidemic because there are no human cases outside an epidemic. You can't work out truly whether a vaccine is both safe and efficacious and effective unless you do that research during an epidemic. And this is a unique opportunity to ensure that we do everything that Tom just said, but in the inevitable future epidemics, that we do not have no access to decent diagnostics, decent treatment, so we change the communication around coming into a treatment centre, and we have vaccines that, at the very least, would mean that no healthcare worker dies of Ebola again. So I'd, I would just add that. Peter, do no, you want to add anything? No, I agree. That? Yeah, and then... S Seth Berkeley got a comment and then, and then a question. Um, I couldn't agree with you more about ring fencing, infectious disease, funds. You know, evolution is going to occur. I know some people in my home country don't believe that, but evolution <laughs> is going to occur. We're going to continue to have new bugs, new infectious disease outbreaks. And once and for all, and, and you're absolutely right, the history is over 20 years as we go up and down, we need to have that adequately resourced. We need to have the laboratory facilities, et cetera. The question for me is, in, in development speak, we're about primary health care, we're about primary education. Critical to this is getting graduate education, strong universities, strong research mm. institutions. So Mali is another country that you know has a vaccine testing unit that has a really good set of scientists, and they played very importantly in this. So how do we shift the mindset to say you know yes, we have to have primary healthcare, university healthcare, et cetera, but we also need to have in parallel very strong local institutions with high level people and the incentives in place, you know, to be able to keep them because other Otherwise, you know, we're going to fly in and fix things and fly out again, and that's a problem. Yeah, huge. Peter, do you want to start? Then I'm sure. Yeah, Tom I think this is a very, a very important issue uh, from the perspective of the de in the development world. When it comes to education, with first everybody primary education and then secondary education and tertiary education, and and uh, and this kind of institution, this kind of a private luxury type of thing, and and particularly for sub-Saharan Africa, as long as there aren't institutions that are producing the intellectual property lawyers, the engineers, uh, not only, I mean, all the other professionals and so on, it will uh, risk it to remain an extraction economy or, uh, you know, cash crop economy and won't be ready. 
Uh, and I think the example of certainly East and Southeast Asia is that, uh, shows that the other way is possible. And uh, so we need to invest in that, um, you know, just at the same time as we invest in health system strengthening and so on. So it should become part, integral part of the, you know, international development agenda. I couldn't agree more. I would just add, in addition to the health <coughs> system strengthening and the educational at every levels, public health system strengthening has really been neglected. Yeah. And if there's one lesson from Ebola, it's the need to have resilient public health systems mm -hmm. around the world. They're our best buy, whether it's for vaccine implementation or outbreak mm -hmm. detection response. Yeah. So I, I, I would feel yeah. a little bit more optimistic than, than, than your question sort of implied, but I know you don't feel. And, and that is, I, th I think there is a growing awareness of this. We, and we mustn't just stop either at primary or secondary or tertiary. We have to, there has to be a career path for people mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. who mm -hmm. can stay. I mean, I'm not a Fair development enough. expert, and there are many in this room who are, but it can't just stop at what has traditionally been PhDs and then nothing, because yeah. the brain drain will take people away from... Mm. So well, we have to think... If you're good, you go to the West. Uh, uh, yeah. Absolutely, and that has to be. But give credit to many people in this room who, who I know who have played a major role in that. And as Tom said, CDC have played a, a huge role in this in training epidemiologists around the world, whatever we all think of epidemiology. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, no, you were first. You were first. Sorry. Young Wook, I'm from Korea, and then I'm the um, president and CEO of a National Medical Center in Korea. And then I'm very much grateful for your great opinions. And then I'd like to ask you, panelists, all of you, uh, that uh, how we can do improve um, health issues in terms of global health security uh, by using ODAs, like uh, from north to south, trans uh, transferring all kinds of uh, know-hows and to help them out in terms of funding as well as technologies. ODA, as you know that uh, under OECD, countries, you have a TAC to improve uh, ODAs, but I don't think they are doing really systematically in terms of health issues for the global health securities. What's your concrete ideas about that? Peter, do you want to start on that? Uh, this is a, we could have another session on that. Has ODA uh, improved actually the health of the people in the, in the world, in low and middle income countries? Oh, yeah, sorry, overseas develop, official development assistance. Thank you for the question. So, uh, and um, when you look at where the, 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 the fastest and the, the greatest improvement in health has occurred, it has occurred in countries that has basically, have basically not benefited that much from uh, this uh, development assistance, particularly in Asia and in Latin America. However, um, I think that the, um, the time has come also to rethink that. I believe that many of the solutions um, in, or, or, you know, achievements in, in health will come from no longer just from the classic countries, uh, in North America, uh, Japan, uh, and, and, and Western Europe, that every epidemic will be an opportunity to learn uh, that how we da deal with chronic diseases, that that's something that can, you know, the ideas will come from all over the world today. So um, we need, yes, uh, we need to share the wealth. Korea can share more of its wealth uh, with uh, countries that are uh, less well off. But um, I don't think that the, the old paradigm where the problems are in a number of countries, what we call the North and the, uh, sorry, the solutions in the North and the problems in the South, that is also changing. A lot of excellent research is going on today in countries that were not on the map, you know, and we see that also when you look even at the world ranking of universities, Korea, Singapore, I mean, you know, coming up in a, in, a, in a big way, China and so on. I would, I also feel more optimistic about that. There is a tendency to be cynical and say, well, it's not working anywhere. Having spent the last 18 years living in Vietnam, having been born in Singapore when there were open sewers in the middle of the, what is now called the Central Business District, and that wasn't many decades ago, and, and countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa that are on absolutely the right trajectory, I think there is a tendency to say, to be really gloomy about it, and I, and I think that is in itself counterproductive. And so I, I think there is, whilst there's need for reform, as with WHO as we talked about, but there's not a need to just throw everything out no. and say none of it's working. Because many countries actually are on a very optimistic trajectory, I believe. Tom? There are important success stories and it's important to learn from them. Whether it's immunization 
for training of epidemiologists or outbreak detection and control, laboratory networks. The African Society for Laboratory Medicine now has certified laboratories all over Africa. So there are success stories, but there are also failures to learn from as well. Mm. And one of the things that I think we need to do increasingly is have a level of contingent assistance. Uh, countries have to create career tracks for people, or there's no point in trying to build a system when it's just going to collapse. Countries have to get the the match that they choose between public and private sector in a way that's workable so that if five out of six dollars are being spent from poor people's pockets for private sector care, at least the government has to provide some level of oversight of that care. I'm going to bring hand, hands in here because he's talked about this brilliantly often that we talk about the so-called developing world as a, as a group together when clearly it isn't. Hands. And there's no definition. Uh, I came back from three months being uh, main advisor and epidemiological surveillance in Liberia. And I can testify the great help we had from CDC, from WHO and MSF that has been leading the organization and African Union now being, being so. Uh, <coughs> what was the sad thing was the way development aid funding made work irrational. That's my reflection. Uh, the funding from CDC was to take care of the United States and yet so great work also. The only thing we criticized for you before was we wanted more of you and we wanted fewer for longer period. Yeah. That's what we wanted. But you could do what you could within your situation. Yeah. And, and WHO had a core budget, which is, is it 12% or 14%? And they were dependent on, on sort of other money. It's not rational the way they are organized. <coughs> the saddest thing was this, this Ebola treatment units, which was on eight months. There was no way we could stop them from being built in Monrovia. We knew two months ago there would be extra beds. There was not two beds per patient. There are 10 beds per patient, 20 beds per patient. And the government had tough times, tough times to, to convince the, the aid organization to stop building them. In the end, they were allowed to build them, and they inaugurated them, but they couldn't open them. It was a waste of money, and that couldn't be managed. So what I see... But hands, how did you... You knew, might have known it was a waste of money, and then what happens if the epidemic had taken a turn that even you could not have predicted? We could... Where would the, you be sent, sitting no, now? No, we were gradually seeing where it was going. That was not the case. This was the stupid argument they had. <laughs> the problem we had with data was that data were used for two purposes. Numbers were needed to be reported and communicated, mainly in the rich end of the world, and they were used in, for research papers, some which were useful, other which was not necessary. But data for management, we had very little. Mm. And we presented the data yeah. on the table. They just oh. didn't want to listen because they already had the money. And probably the contracts were already written, so they had to be constructed. It, it was very difficult to have the data to work in a managerial way and to swap from this crisis management down to exactly what you say now, the finest and best epidemiologist to what we need is Jon Snow. He has need no, new Jon Snows. We we'll do it in the same way and really understand it. So I would I'm think that there, this Hans, control, we need other, the control other is, want to ask. it has to go out of aid money. It has to be global security money that secure this over the years into the future. Aid money is too unreliable. If somebody could pinch the microphone. I, I just would say, while, while the next person is asking, the, the biggest challenge in Ebola was how fast things changed. Uh, from, yeah. I went in August and September. Within one week of leaving, things were dramatically yeah. different. Yeah. I went end of December. Within one week of leaving, yeah. things were very, very different. Yeah. We had got, just before, after Tom was there, Peter and I were there, and, and it was dramatically different from when Tom was there, only, actually, I think, 10 days before. Yeah. We were there. yeah. So this Preferably not Ebola, but it could Actually, be. it's, okay, so here's my question. So I'm a little haunted by the fact that it was 40 years when you were first, when the global health community was first talking about Ebola, and we didn't do much. So I guess my question is, is there another virus that the global health <laughs> community is thinking about at this moment? Um, that is, hasn't captured our attention and that we should be thinking about to get ahead of the curve? I think we would all have a list for that. The list, I actually don't think the list is huge, to well, be honest. I think but we'd all start with flu. But there is a list. Yeah, we would all start with flu. And we flu, would yeah. all start with flu. And mm. I hate to, to go back to Donald Rumsfeld, but of course there's <laughs> the knowns and there's the unknowns. <laughs> and there are, a, in my view, a relatively small number mm. of knowns that we do need to learn. One of the lessons, and one of the lessons for me, hate to mention Ebola again, 
is the demonstration that once you've got a vaccine on the shelf, don't just wait at the non-human primate level. Make sure you've got the safety data if you're yeah. likely to want to use it. So yeah. the list for that is not that extensive in my view. Tom, mm -hmm. absolutely agree. Fl flu for me remains yeah. the big number one. But I could give you a list yeah. of others. Um, and who knows what the next HIV will be? Yeah. And who knows how SARS. different the world would be today if we had recognized HIV yeah. decades ago and mm -hmm. had containment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not only new organisms or uh, microbes, but also uh, untreatable, I mean, multi-resistant uh, yes. microorganisms. And yeah, we have not talked about drug resistance, yeah. and, and uh, in my view at least, uh, drug resistance has to be put into the same yeah. category yeah. as the emerging infectious diseases. Yeah. In my view, it will be the most important emerging infectious disease of the 21st Absolutely, uh, century. Absolutely, and I, I, the triumvirate of risk is bioterrorism, because unfortunately the great tools we have that allow us to do things for good also would allow uh, bad things to be Where do you stand on gain-of-function studies, Tom? Well, it's very clear that uh, they have risk, and it's not so clear what the benefit is. So I would say yeah. uh, there w are times when they should be done uh, very, very carefully, but that risk-benefit ratio is something I think we have to recalibrate. Because the reason I ask that, one of my worries, gain-of-function studies is where you change a pathogen so that it makes it more transmissible, more yeah. relevant. My, my worry is the, the global capacity for conducting surveillance at the level we think it should be, and even at today's level, I'm not convinced that's mm. sustainable mm. when we have to respond to every single flu epidemic, H7N9 in China at the moment. We've got no idea if H7N9 is going to be a global threat or will just remain a relatively minor mm. Mm. avian influenza that infects a few humans. And I think understanding the biology of that becomes critical. I don't disagree with Tom's risk-benefit uh, discussion. Sir, and then come to you. In the case of Ebola, there's no, there's no vaccine. But in the case of influenza... Better just introduce yourself to... All right, I'm Tachi Yamada. Tachi I'm uh, with Takeda Pharmaceuticals. In the case of uh, Ebola, there is no vaccine. In the case of influenza, there was a vaccine. And, and this raises the question of global governance because the vaccine that was available was basically nationalized in every country that produced the vaccine. Therefore, nations acted in their self-interest, not necessarily in the best interest of the world. And how, how does that prevent it? It's a, I'm afraid with only two minutes left of this session, it's going to be <laughs> awfully challenging, but just I was very, very involved in what which goes back now eight or nine years around the, as portrayed, the Indonesian ministry. Ministry of Health opinion, mm -hmm. why should we share our flu vac viruses when you'll just sell us back a vaccine at cost price? We, I don't th even within international health regulations <coughs> and with, within the contract that was organised post bird flu, I'm not sure still we've got that right. And that inevitably countries will go back to national interest when, when, when the threat really hits, inevitably. And that's where global governance comes in. we take the last question. Coming back to the issue of surveillance, getting to zero, sorry, Dr. Annie Sparrow, I'm from Mount Sinai Hospital. There are parallels between the appearance of Ebola in West Africa and the reappearance of polio in Syria. And I say that in terms of governments tend to cover up infectious disease. We saw that in both countries, Guinea covered it up, Syria covered it up. We see these fragile health systems, one was neglected, one was destroyed. In terms of data, we have to get it in a timely manner, we have to respond to it. Here, the imperative, as I see it, is the opportunity, the imperative to invest in surveillance. We depended on surveillance for smallpox eradication. We depend on surveillance. And yet, we then depend on aid money and we put money into organisations such as Save the Children Sierra Leone, which have neither the clinical capacity to treat Ebola nor the public health expertise to do the contact tracing, the prevention that is absolutely essential to get data in a timely manner and to convey it to respond. And that, as he is the issue, because we are dealing with the, these are issues of global governance. This, is, was, this was a year where we saw the two public health emergencies of international concern. You need to deal with the government issue where they tend to cover up, and then to deal with the actual how do you get that expertise on the ground to do the surveillance that we desperately need mm. to address these. I'm just going to take Chairman's prerogative and, and say I'm absolutely behaving in, in surveillance, don't say anything otherwise, but unless we add response to surveillance, surveillance in itself will not solve the problem. We are going to have to finish there, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Peter. Uh, very, uh, and the audience here, I'm afraid we didn't go to the social media audience. Key lessons to be learned, inevitably. Global governance, I think our view is 
a strong WHO remains critical to global governance and we would do everything we can to try and enhance and support it in a positive way to make it stronger. Surveillance is critical. Emerging infectious diseases have to be put into the context of the society they're occurring in, the national <coughs> systems we heard about, the non-communal diseases and the endemic diseases that they are there in. And if we forget them, they will come back to haunt us in future. Mm. And with that, I'll close the session. Thank you very much. I'm staying around for a few minutes. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm staying around for a few minutes. I'm not sure if Tom and Peter are, but... Yeah.